All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Purdue Student Government and the Purdue Graduate Student Government Immigration Attorney General Information Session of the fall 20. Uh, Oh, no, that's not fall. It's spring of the spring 2022 semester. Um, as, a, as a reminder, this initiative was developed to increase access to immigration legal services by offering these monthly uh, virtual services free to both the undergraduate student and the graduate student population at Purdue. And like I said, the session will be recorded and it'll be uploaded to the Purdue Student Government YouTube page. And this is a joint initiative from Purdue Graduate Student Government and Purdue Student Government. And we'd like to give a special thanks to Student Legal Services, International Students and Scholars, the Burton D. Morgan Center for Entrepreneurship, and of course, you guys at Green and Spiegel for working with us. Um, so I will put in the chat the attendance form. And uh, once I do that, but first let me just uh, introduce myself. My name is Shannon King. I am the president for Purdue Student Government. I'm a senior and I'm studying political science. Someone's at the door. Um, and I'm here to introduce Jonathan Grode. Jonathan, um, he graduated from Temple University, the Beasley School of Law, magna cum laude. And Jonathan Grode served as the US Practi Practice Director and Managing Partner for the firm Grieven Spiegel. Uh, Jonathan has worked continuously in the U.S. business immigration law field since 1999 and has amassed a considerable experience obtaining non-immigrant and immigrant visas for new company startups, professional workers, artists, and entertainers, athletes, physicians, and scientific researchers. So thank you so much for being here with us, and thanks for joining everyone, and I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan. First of all, big sorry for not for the confusion last week. I, I felt terrible about that. So I really do apologize. And I hope you guys can forgive me. I know I'm taking you out of your regularly scheduled President's Day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I uh, apologize. Um, I know a lot of you had had individual sessions with the associates at my firm and uh, partners. Um, so I don't know if the questions are really like relevant that were asked, but honestly, there's such a small group here today if you guys just wanna um, turn your video on and ask some questions, or I can talk about things in generalities. One thing I will say before we kind of hop into it is that your school has amazing resources available to it. Like truly, truly, truly unbelievable. Your International Student and Scholars Office is one of the best in the country. And if you have questions about F1 or OPT in particular, like anything related to student status, I ask that you talk to them. And the reason why is because <clears throat> the school really does control your seeped record, which is um, what actually evidences your ability to be in the United States and maintain your, your status in the US. And um, they're best suited to address those questions. Purdue has its own policies and procedures, which you should really follow. And uh, so just a little bit of a note on that. Um, but yeah, we can, you can just ask me questions that came in if you think they're interesting or we can open up the floor, but with, with such a small group, I'm, I'm happy to make it a little bit more specialized than we normally do. And if that's the case, um, if anyone has any objections, uh, if you would like for me to stop the recording right now, just throw it in, up in the chat. I'm gonna wait maybe like 10 seconds. Just wanna be respectful of everyone. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and pause the recordings when students ask the questions, and then Jonathan, when you have the answers, I'll continue. Okay, sounds okay. good. Up a little bit. Why don't we talk about H-1Bs? Because that's like a big thing, right? Everybody's into the H-1B. Um, the H-1B is your standard working visa, and <clears throat> it's predicated on a very simple test. Does the position require a degree in a specific field of endeavor? And does the individual have a degree related to that field of endeavor? And I like to call this matchy matchy, you know, does it match? So if you're a chemical engineer in student and you find a job as a chemical engineer, that's a pretty good idea that you're going to have a good match for H-1B purposes. And if you're a marketing manager and you have a degree in marketing, that's a pretty good match. But if you're looking and applying to a marketing manager position and you have a degree in chemical engineering, you're not gonna get an H-1B. So you're really kind of like dialed into what your field of endeavor is and what the position requires. So that's a big part of it. The secondary thing, and this is where a lot of people get caught up is there's something called a prevailing wage. And you have to make sure that 
the position <clears throat> you know, is being paid at a level that is commiserate with what the government thinks that intended wage is in your area of employment. So um, I'm gonna put a link in the uh, chat box here for you. Um, it's called the FLA data, FLC Data Center. And with this, you can pretty much look up any job in any part of the country and it will tell you what the minimum salaries are. Why is that important? Well, it's really important because, you know, if you are like working a job and you hope to be sponsored for an H-1B, either this year or after, you know, you do your OPT year, you want to make sure that it's a job that's going to pay you enough. You know, you don't want to be wasting your time with an employer where there's like a $20,000 or $30,000 discrepancy between what you're getting paid and what you need to get paid. So, you know, that is um, something that I encourage you to look up in, in advance of taking your job. And the third thing is, is there has to be a number available. And that's where people get really caught up, right? There's 85,000 of them available annually. And last year, they received over 300,000 petitions for the 85,000 spot. Now, a lot of people that were selected never ended up actually filing their petitions and a lot more visas became available than was originally thought. But the numerical availability is a key component. What's really fascinating is that if you get a job at an institute of higher education, you're not subject to those numerical limitations. It's only for private industry. So one of the pro tips that I give people is don't discount university jobs. If your field of endeavor like allows it to, to have a job at a university, then you know you should go for it. So um, I see that there is a question that came in, which is H1B has some kind of bonus for having a master's degree. Um, <clears throat> so what that comes to and, and this says, uh, but the job says requires bachelor's or master's degree, does the bonus still apply? I think in terms of a bonus, what you're talking about is. With those numerical limitations, there's 20,000 that are set aside specifically for individuals that have earned a master's degree or higher from an institute of higher education in the United States. So that allows you to actually have two lottery draws. So what happens is, is if you're a master's degree holder, then you get counted against the regular cap, the 65,000 that are available and annually. If you're not selected in that cap, your number get your name gets rerun again through that special 20,000 cap. And for people, um, who have that H-1B and are doing it based on a master's, you actually have essentially two bites at the lottery apple, which is really beneficial. It does not, it does not and is not dictated by what the employer requires. It's actually what you have obtained in terms of education. So I, is that what you're referring to in terms of the bonus? If so, it is quite an advantage. Um, okay, so, you know, the H-1B is really, really the standard, standard working visa, and, um, but there are other people who can have other visa classes, oh, here's a follow-up question, so as long as a job requires some sort of degree in my field, it doesn't matter if it's specifically requires a master's, yes, that is 100% correct, you got to make sure your degree is related to what they require, and the position must require at least a bachelor's level education. But really what becomes an issue is, you know, not that they require a master's degree, but that you have earned a master's degree from a US institution of higher education. So it's a good question. Now, a lot of times people don't get selected in the H-1B lottery and it sucks, but that's just kind of the way it is. You know, if you do have a degree in a STEM field, you can always get extra OPT time. But another visa classification that's really, really, really popular is the O-1. And the O-1 is for extraordinary ability. And it's a different kind of test than the H-1B. So with the H-1B, we had that matchy, matchy. Does your position require a degree in a specific field of endeavor? Do you have a degree related to that field of endeavor? Um, that situation does not apply with the O-1. The O-1 instead says, do you meet three out of a list of a certain amount of criteria? And the government has really been making, trying to make this easier for people that have a STEM degree. They, they've actually published a memo the week before last that greatly like, I would say, 
liberalizes the application of the standard. So we are seeing it easier, especially for people with STEM. But you really do have to show that you meet three of these criteria. Some of them, and, and to be honest with you, O's typically work better for PhDs or master students because they like to see publications. They want to see people writing about you. But holding a critical role for a distinguished organization, um, having reviewed other people's work, like if you do journal review work, these are all factors that can work towards an O. So all hope is not lost if you don't get the H1B. But you know, if you are interested in the O1 classification, knowing what those criteria are and being able to work towards them can be really, really, really beneficial for providing an option in case you're not selected in the H1B lottery. Um, so those are like your two main types of non-immigrant visas that people apply for. The other tip that I like to give is you can apply for, if you're looking for jobs, apply for companies that are multinational. And the reason why I say that is because sometimes if you're not selected in the H-1B lottery, they can send you abroad to one of their entities. And if you work outside the United States for a year, you can then be transferred back to the United States in a visa classification called L or intercompany transferees. And more and more international companies are like willing to do this because of the advantage that the individual has by having a global experience within the organization and being able to return to the United States. So a lot of people are like, wow, if I don't get the H-1B, I gotta go back to school. I gotta figure out a way to do curriculum practical training or something like that. And that might not be the case. The O-1 is an option and the LV is an option. So from a very practical perspective, if you're looking for jobs <clears throat> after graduation, don't discount universities because they're not subject to the H-1B numerical limitations. Always consider multinational companies because of the possibility of using an L visa if you're not selecting the H-1B lottery. And look at your credentials and see if there's ways to bolster them in case you might be able to get an O-1. So that's really the best way to play figuring out your next steps after school and remembering that there are more than just the H-1B visa available. I don't know if this is applicable to anybody on this particular call, but there's also special visa classifications available for certain nationalities that can pay dividends. For example, Canadians and Mexicans have access to a visa called TN based under the United States, Canada, Mexico Free Trade Agreement, formerly known as NAFTA, or <clears throat> Um, people from Singapore and, and Chile, of all places, have free trade agreements that carry visas that are specific to those nationalities. And last but not least, Australia has a similar provision as well. So in addition to knowing and looking at your options between the H, L, and O visa, looking at your individual nationality can also sometimes provide solutions to immigration problems. Unfortunately, those are the only five countries that have special visas right now. Believe it or not, there's a bill in Congress right now that will extend that to Koreans and a special visa just for Koreans called E4, if it does go to fruition. And it does have bipartisan support, so it might happen. And um, <clears throat> there's talk about Ireland getting added as well. So, but right now it's just those five nationalities. Um, but that's really it about non-immigrant visas, at least for today's session. Does anybody have any uh, questions? or for employers, is it harder to get an employer to sponsor a green card compared to an H-1B? Yeah, I mean, most employers want you to have H-1B status before they're willing to go ahead and sponsor a green card. The interesting thing about it is that um, the green card in some ways is more of a sure thing depending on the industry because you don't have those quotas and numerical limitations. But it's very challenging to go from student straight to green card under a traditional method for obtaining permanent residency. Traditionally speaking, in order to get a green card, you have to do a test in the labor market to ensure that there's no minimally qualified US workers available for the job. You know, that's what you're really looking at. And right now, that's a pretty easy thing to do just because of the mere fact that the job market is very tight and a lot of employers are struggling to find workers. So by consequence, you, you would imagine that it's relatively easy to test the labor market. The problem is timing. The problem is cash investment. You know, and are these companies willing to make that effort before you've secured a non-immigrant visa? And most of the time, unfortunately, the answer is no.
Uh, <clears throat> are non-citizens working as faculty in university also a H-1B visa or another type? Um, often faculty will get H-1B visas. It's pretty easy because again, you're not subject to the numerical limitations. Sometimes, especially for advanced positions, they'll look at the O-1. Um, you know, you do have to, if you're, if you're just doing like research or if you're in a non-tenure track position, you have to look at the temporary nature of the job that can impact things. But nine times out of 10, the university will pursue an H-1B visa for faculty. And another question here about the national interest waiver and does it apply to undergraduate students as well? So national interest waiver is a way to get a green card. And remember, I just told you about the test of the labor market. Well, what the national interest waiver is saying is the work that you're doing is national scope, it's intrinsic merit, and the foreign national is like such an expert in the field, it doesn't make sense to have somebody with a similar background retrained. So you're saying, because this work is so important, because this individual is so important, we're gonna waive that test of the labor market. Now, the question here is, can you do it for an undergraduate? Yes, you can in theory and practice, you usually don't, unless the person is really doing some groundbreaking work like getting patents and PH, you know, uh, publications and really making hay and getting a lot of notoriety. You're not going to really poke down a national interest waiver or frankly an EB1, which is the employment based first preference category for outstanding researchers and professors or <clears throat> for extraordinary ability unless the individual like has a lot of those publications available. So the path, this is a question as a statement, the path will usually be some like graduate from college, OPT, H1B, at some point company sparks green card. And yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> you pretty much hit the nail on the head. That's how things typically progress for most foreign nationals in the United States. Um, there's a question here that says, what is the process like for becoming an immigrant after graduation? That's what we were talking about with green cards. A green card and immigrant is the same thing. So you have non-immigrant, which are your temporary work visas, like the H and the L and the O that we talked about. And then you have immigrant visas, which are actually permanent residency. So, you know, that's a, that's a big factor in there. What are the options for a spouse of an H-1B visa holder in terms of work authorization? It's really tricky for spouses to get employment authorization after H-1B. There are some provisions where if you're far enough along in the green card process while you're waiting for your turn in the queue. And this most often affects Chinese nationals, um, <clears throat> affects Indian nationals in particular. If you're far enough along in the process, you can get an interim employment authorization issued while you wait for your turn to be eligible for a green card. So it is possible, but it's not automatic. Um, so unfortunately, spousals and H-1B work authorization is, is, has been and will be a continuing and ongoing issue. Um, can you try to apply for a green card as a student? You can. There's nothing preventing you from applying for a green card as a student. You'd probably have to do something along the self-sponsored mechanism, which is going to be that EB1A extraordinary ability or that national interest waiver. So it's very, very, very challenging. Uh, but there are rare cases, especially for people doing PhDs where we've done it and it's been successful. Next question is, theoretically, if a company is willing to sponsor a green card immediately after getting employed, are there any barriers for an OPT holder to get a green card? Uh, not per se. I mean, you can definitely do it. Where it becomes tricky is travel because OPT is an extension of F1 and F1 is a visa that carries 100% non-immigrant intent. If you're here and you get an option, then you're fine. You can go ahead and do the green card process, but travel will be very difficult while you're waiting for some of the interim benefits. And while you have a pending green card application, you do get an interim benefit of work authorization and travel permission. If you leave the country before those are issued, you can have a lot of problems, a lot of problems. So yes, theoretically you could do that. Um, it does not work well again for Indian and Chinese nationals because of the long backlogs. We, we do do it for other countries and we've done it with some degree of success, but it's typically not the way people will proceed. Are there any questions from the intake chart that you'd like to ask me while we let people brainstorm a little bit? Um, while you're looking at those questions, there was one that just came in that says, does the travel restriction also apply to transferring from OPT to H-1B? Yes, but in a different sort of way. 
Um, if your OPT expires, let's say uh, June 30th, and the H-1B starts October 1st, if you don't leave the country, you're allowed to work in that interim period of time. But if you leave the country after your H-1B petition is lodged, then you lose that interim continuation of employment authorization. So there are travel restrictions for going from OPT to H-1B. It's not necessarily as severe as the consequences you find when we're talking about uh, that green card issue straight from being a student, but <clears throat> there are some problems there. It is doable, but not necessarily recommended. And when I'm making these recommendations to you, I'm making them solely from an immigration perspective. I can't tell you if that conference that you're going to be a keynote speaker at or going to your sister's wedding is more important. That's a decision you have to make. And certainly if there's an emergent situation, if you're in the green card process, but you haven't gotten that permission to work or travel, we can help push that along in case of a true emergency. Any other questions? I just have a quick question. So if you're applying for a green card, and I've heard that you don't really hear back after a few, it could be a few years, but after that, well, what happens if you get rejected? Well, it, it typically, you know, whether or not you've been approved for like the basis to get the green card, which is the most critical part. And, and you can do premium processing for that. You can expedite that where, where it becomes a rub is how long it takes to get the actual green card, but that's more form over substance. And very rarely, if you have that underlying petition approved to give you permission to file, very rarely will you actually have an issue with the issuance of the green card itself. Got it. I just wonder, like, it, I mean, do people fear that they will, like, would they ever ask you to leave because now that you're on record for not even holding a green card? Well, you're going to have to maintain some sort of status underneath and every situation is different. Usually you're maintaining like an H-1B while you're waiting for the green card mm -hmm. um, or you'll have that interim authorization and travel permission that you can renew. But you can't just be here hanging out waiting for a green card and be able to continue to work. You need something to tie you to right. that employment. Yeah. Gotcha. Any other questions? Man, I did such a great, oh, may I uh, know the, I felt like I just won and now I, I, now I have two more questions. If we are on the, oh, oh, if we're on the OPT or H1B and expect to get fired soon, woo. Um, it depends which one you're on because there are different requirements, but you would need to, um, there is a grace period for both of those classifications of 60 days. If you're unable to leave, then you can switch over to a visitor classification to tidy up your affairs. But if you get fired, it's a problem and you should probably consult an immigration attorney to go over your specific situation. And I do have another question here that says, may I know the purpose or rationale behind travel restrictions for green card applicants? Um, so it's a little bit tricky, but historically speaking, you were never able to get a green card directly in the United States. You had to go to an embassy or consulate outside the United States. But understanding how that disrupted people, they created this sort of legal fiction of adjustment of status, which is actually giving you the green card without having to take that travel. Um, why it becomes problematic. It's not problematic for everybody. If you have a dual intent visa, like an H or an L, you can travel. It's just when you have a non-immigrant visa, like an F1, and you're to travel after declaring immigrant intent, and you try to come back on the student visa, they say, no, you can't come back as a student because you've declared immigrant intent. You follow me? So it makes it so you have a barrier to re-entry because the visa that you have does not match the intent quotient associated with the process you're going under. Any other questions?
If starting to file a green card while on OPT and the application is not successful, would that prevent you from renewing an F1 in the future? It could, it could. It depends how far along you are in the process. Um, if it's just the test of the labor market and labor certification, typically it doesn't, but once you get further along in the process, it really can. Can you apply for immigrant status for reasons other than work? Yes, there are other ways, like if you have a family member, immediate family member in particular, a spouse is one of the most common ways, but you can also file for asylum if you've had a change in country condition and you fear persecution for returning to your home country. Um, there are other ways, certainly. These are great questions, actually. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to muddy the water with too much other than like, you know, reiter uh, the assuming the asylum process is not that, I mean, it depends on your circumstances. Like sometimes they create like blanket permission. Like for example, right now, and I don't want to get too political about it, but they're making like almost an automatic asylum for people from Hong Kong. That's in a bill that was recently proposed to Congress because of the tensions with China. So it depends on your circumstance. Asylum is a very tricky thing. The only thing I will say to you about asylum, if you file for asylum, you can't go back to your home country. Because if you're getting your basis for remaining in the United States on fear of going back to your home country, it's a really bad look to travel back there. So you gotta be careful there. <clears throat> There is some news about removing green card caps from STEM PhD holders, but not quite sure what that's about. Um, yeah, there is a lot of chatter about that. That's in a bill that's passed by the House and will be going back to the Center for Reconciliation. It's not really going to, you're still going to have to have like a mechanism for getting the green card. It just means that you won't have any issues with backlogs or wait times to actually get the card itself. And then somebody asked, will submitting I-140 affect your OPT? It can. It can. It depends whether or not you tick to have the immigrant visa issued abroad or whether or not you tick adjustment of status on the I-140 petition itself. But certainly filing an I-140 is like on some levels a declaration of immigrant intent. And again, that OPT is non-immigrant intent. So they don't, they don't really work well together. Any other questions? Well, I just wanna go over some of the tips that I really wanted to cover and reiterate them once again. H-1B is not the end all be all of your status. And I know we have a lot of people interested here in getting green cards while they're in process and that can work for some nationalities. But when you're looking for a job and you're thinking about what you're doing after graduation, it's good to be pragmatic. You know, to check out that to make sure that the job that you're getting meets the wage requirements. There's no point in working for somebody if they're not gonna be able to sponsor you down the road if your goal is to remain in the United States. Think about applying for jobs at institutes of higher education. Even if you're not a professor, you can still take advantage of there no, not being a, a cap uh, <clears throat> requirement. Like you don't have to be a researcher or a professor to get that. Think about looking at your credentials and seeing if you could qualify for O1 status. O1 is for extraordinary ability. But a lot of the criteria are easy to obtain if you put work into it. So you can make yourself extraordinary. Look at large multinational companies, the ability to be transferred abroad for a year, gain some great experience outside the United States and then come back on the L visa can also be a way to solve the problem. Um, <clears throat> and then there is another follow-up question here. So I asked earlier about the H-1B and requires bachelor's or master's degree. It seems that that doesn't matter. What about the green card? Yeah, it matters big time for the green card. So if a position requires a master's degree or five years of progressive experience, you can be EB2, which is a better preference category than EB3, which is for a baccalaureate level education or a skilled worker, which has two years of experience. So, you know, this, this questioner really picked up on a very astute point. When it comes to applying for the H-1B and, and getting into that special lottery for master's degrees or higher, it's about the individual's credentials. But when you're looking at a green card and determining preference category, it's about the employer's requirements. That's a very astute point and a great question. 
Does anybody else have any additional questions? Sometimes there's hesitancy for PIs to support the postdoc transit from J1 or OPT to H1B. What is the reason for that? Um, primarily because they're more expensive, frankly. Like J1s are very cheap for the university and H1Bs have a lot of filing fees and a lot of time involved. So, and you know, if they're worried about hits to the departmental budget, that might be something that they're concerned about. There really should be no reason why you know, they wouldn't sponsor you for an H1B. So I think cost is probably the most hit prohibitating factor. <clears throat> All right, well, listen, this service that you have offered by Purdue is amazing. And I hope to be coming to campus to do one of these in person, depending on how things go this spring. We'll keep, we're keeping a close eye on it. Uh, I really do love West Lafayette. It's a beautiful, place in the world. And um, I'm happy to be a small part of the community. <clears throat> if you feel like your specific questions weren't addressed, please make an appointment. We give complimentary consultations. I think we run them two days every month or something like that. You can speak to an attorney about your specific situation at no charge. So take advantage of it. And I will be back next month with more updates and uh, more questions from, from you guys. Thank you so, so much. And just to reiterate, yes, um, we will be advertising these consultation sessions uh, through Purdue Student Government and through P Purdue Graduate Student Government. Um, it, it's, a first serve, it's a first come first serve basis, but those links will be included in um, the Instagram bios of each of our Instagram pages. So be on the lookout for that. And our next session should be on March 2nd, I think. Yep, March 2nd. So that's that's the next and it's in my calendar. So I'll and definitely in be his there. calendar. So he'll be there. He'll <laughs> be there to answer all of your questions again. And uh, please sign up for the individual session, individual consultation sessions, which will happen March 2nd and March 3rd. Okay. So that's it. I will stay on for a little bit and um, but you guys are free to leave. All right, everybody. Great to talk to you. Thank and you. hopefully we'll get the bigger group and We'll still have time to answer H1B questions. And again, thank you guys so much. And thanks to the student government for offering such a great service. Have and a great afternoon. Guys. Happy, Happy President's Day. Happy President's Day.